I, I, I'm, I'm supposed to uh, say something to say um, that we would be on live, which I did not do. And which means probably we have to give people like five minutes or so, so we can have people on here. Um, I completely forgot to do that. Um, but hopefully, let's see if people do come through and then we can get started. Um, okay. And whilst we do that, I would just hop on here one second. Give me a second. Uh, I've never done this before. Um, excuse me. The initial plan was really to do a video and then post that. And then I'm like, why not do a Facebook Live? It's not uh, my comfort zone, but why not we do that? And so welcome to the people who's who've I great great to see the people that are on already um I don't know if I should get started you let me know I am really thinking that we do give some time um to some other folks I don't know what I'm doing everybody have their strongholds but this is definitely not one of mine um but yeah, assalamu alaikum, good afternoon, good morning, or good night, wherever you are. Um, I am extending hugs to you, virtual hugs, of course. And I hope everyone is keeping safe in this very weird um, times. And I know I've not been the most, um, uh, uh, let's say, visible person when it comes to social media. But today it's a it's an important day for me and for a lot of people, and I'm sure you're wondering why is too far on live Facebook Live today. Um, it's because today is June 25th. Um, is it June 25th? Yes, today is June 25th. Um, it marks one year since last year in in 2019 when I decided to unburden myself with a story and an experience that only I um, am aware of and had to carry for the past few years. But also, it's been five years since, the, um, since um, um, I was a victim of, of rape. And, you know, it's weird that that happened in June as well. Um, so it, there is some kind of trend here uh, that happens in June, but so what I want to do is really um, talk about what that's like, realistically, honestly, like I've always tried to do with all of you, um, but also to talk about some of the stories um, that probably haven't made it to the limelight, and there's a reason why some stories do and some stories don't, and we will get into that. We would also talk about the Tufa Foundation, which I've been working on on the ground, and also all the current projects that we are working on, um, and what the future looks like moving forward. But also, whilst doing that, tackling all the socio-cultural BS that some of us um, refuse to carry on, refuse to acknowledge or accept. Um, so, Manglendi Nuyu, Onjarama, Mbal Kontonna, um, but in Gambia and Kolo and everyone who is watching from anywhere, um, I just thought that this was more interactive um, than having to uh, do a video and then like post it. So why not just confront this fear of mine because I'm really social media phobic um, and I've been for the past few years. And also I think it's important to also kind of talk about that um, 
what processing all of that was like and what last year was like as well. So, um, to start with, I am still un un unapologetic about so many things. Um, uh, it's sometimes interesting how for people, once the cameras go off, they think that the existence of the person or their experiences goes along with the cameras, uh, but there are people and human beings that leave behind the scenes that have to continue to exist and heal and survive and, and, and process all of that. So just because they're out of your consciousness doesn't mean they're out of existence, if that makes sense. Um, so last year this time, I mean, a few days ago, I, it's crazy how you cannot explain the feeling enough to depict the actual feeling at the time. Um, today's 2020, June 25th, you know, we're dealing with the coronavirus crisis, we're dealing with all these other things that have come up, trying to confront and reignite the conversation around Black Lives Matter, um, and so much, just so much more, but also realizing that I am in such calmness and in such peace at this time of the year and to just kind of reminiscent around what last year around this time was like it was just it was insane emotionally insane i i remember being on the flight whilst i'm flying to the car and i'm saying to myself what what are you doing <laughs> What what are you doing? What, 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 what? What? The entire time. And every time I pinch myself and with all the emotions and all the fears that are coming through is to say, but we're going to do it. We're going to do this. We're going to do this. Despite all of these things my brains was telling me, you know your people. You have a sanity. You know, chop. Saturbi. Sali. Sala. You know, all of those possibilities that you're weighing, you're weighing in. And once I landed in Dakar, it was like 3 a.m. in the morning. And, you know, um, the organizers in Dakar are already in Dakar. They're organizing the press conference. Um, the New York Times reporter is calling me to confirm dates, to say it's going to happen. We're going to release the uh, document at, you know, 2 p.m. Gambian time or 3 p.m. Gambian time. And I said, okay. Um... I will be waiting, you know, and at the same time, I am speaking to my mom on the phone, of course, and she's, let me take this out, and of course, she's freaking out, um, uh, what time is it, what time are they going to press that button, what's going to happen, and you know, knowing all of what you know, and knowing that there's like a ticking time bomb that's about to go off, but only you and like a few people know that, and you're all sitting on that and you're literally waiting for a moment that is going to change everything. Um, got to Dakar, of course, there was Marion Volkman, Reed, the rest of the team, um, journalists to come the next day, Fatumata Sandeng flew in from Germany, um, catching up through the night and then the next day, you know, it's... It's crazy how you can be sitting in front of an ocean and it's a beautiful hotel and there's all these blue waves, but all you are really thinking about, all you're seeing is bleak and, and, and this unknown hole and ditch that you're about to jump into. Um, and I would film myself uh, in this hotel and the food I was eating would not really sit well but it's there like i'm just eating to survive really and through all of that when i step outside of that room you know if it's to meet journalists if it's to to speak in our next um, um steps what are we going to do it's me telling myself we got this you know there's there, there was a lot of self self vibing that happened like i would stand in the mirror and go like Yes, girl, you know, it was just a lot of that that was happening. That is the reality of what happens. And then when you sit in front of the cameras, um, 
I'm like, we're not going to cry and we're not going to um, um, ask for sympathy and pity, but we're going to be clear and we're going to be precise and we're going to say it as it is. Everyone listening to it, agreeing to it or not, is deserving of clarity, is deserving of see saying something, you know? Um, and sitting there, time goes on, and press, publish, it went. And I know I saw it, a couple of people saw it, and immediately I just panicked. I, I remember my gut just fell when I pressed on that and I saw a beauty queen accuses ex-president Jame. And I, I, freak, I, I freaked out, I cannot explain the feeling, but it was just me going like, oh, okay, we are doing this. It's, it's, it's there, this is happening, this is happening. I think it was that moment that it dawned on me that for real, it is actually happening. But everything after that has really been phases for me. And I think what has been helpful is that the fact that I zoned out, I deliberately and consciously tried to protect my peace and my space, um, you know, signing off of, of Facebook. If I want to post something, I post and I just run and get out of there. Same thing with Messenger, same thing with everywhere else. Um, because I had to, when the wall was falling apart right around me and through my name, I had to find a safe space. I had to find this bracket, like like a, like a vacuum or some football that I can be within and this is my safe space and I had to protect that. Um, and because I was in that safe space and in that bubble, I was able to just look and I was able to listen. Um, as I was listening to women's stories, of course, who would confide in you, and it is heartbreaking and very hard because they're telling you about people and stories, but at the same time asking you to protect their identities. If you can help me, that's great, but do not um, say my identity. And being an avid advocate for protecting women, for respecting the choices that women make, if it's to come out visibly or not, um, I had to take that in, no matter how much hurt that is. Um, but also at the same time, taking note of how the conversation changes, right? How the excuses that we build and the justifications that we make around women and their stories keep changing from, um, is she a Gambian to, you know, when of course then had me speak a bit more, right? And oh, okay, she's Gambian, whatever, but she's punched by the West. And then probably hear me talk about my understanding of women's experiences, my mother, my grandmother, other women, our neighborhood, the misogyny that is so prevalent and we all know it, but somehow we're supposed to dash it and the women are supposed to know their place and just go to the kitchen and pretend like it doesn't exist, right? Um, when they are aware that I am conscious of that and I know what I'm talking about within that perspective, then it moved into she's lying. This is completely fabricated. Um, and then from that to, oh, I actually know her. I mean, there are times I had to go and check if there's another twofer that exists in Gambia apart from me because I'm looking at the person they're talking about, I'm like, who? Me? Man. <laughs> right? Um, but knowing that, and, and, and it's so hard and it's so hurtful when you sit there and a complete stranger, you know, somebody who doesn't even know you, probably they just know your name, making up stories and, 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 and talking about intimate interactions that you've had and you don't even, you've never met that person in your life. And the, the most in, instinctive thing you want to do is jump out and say, no, not true. Do digger, man defumoko, man haumala. You know, that's what you want to do. You want to fight that way. Um, so it takes everything in your being. It took everything in my being 
to sit there in acceptance of being misunderstood, right? I have to sit and get comfortable with being misrepresented. That's hard. <laughs> um, but what has always guided that principle of mine is to say, if I am setting a blueprint for whatever young girl or whatever woman, I want, because they're going to look at the whole blueprint. They're not going to look at, oh, you had the courage or the audacity to come out. But when you did come out, and when people said what they said, how did you react? That is also part of the blueprint and the legacy that you built. Um, so to me is to say, I don't want the Fatu Kumba and Mariam and all these people watching, especially the young ones, to think that it's also their burden and their obligation to have to keep up in responding to that, to have to think they have to physically and verbally fight to be believed, right? That it's okay to tell your truth and seek your justice and hold your own. It is possible to do that. And it's okay to do that, right? That was also what I had in mind. So whatever reaction after that was in, in relation to that, was in trying to paint that picture. For that young person to not think it is their burden to have to stick up for their image and their value and how they're seen or what they're worth. And the best way to do that is to go out there and say, Right? The only person that is worth that confrontation is the person who has harmed your body, is the person who has violated your body. And every time you're given an opportunity to take back your voice and to speak to that person, everyone else is literally a distraction. So in as much as it was so hard for me, I had to be aware and conscious of the young girls that are watching to say, ha! Huh? Duma MC wahta met gena ma wahne li mo ma dal. Wahe da ma amta met talk si Facebook bi. Bes bu neka di defante. Di go back and forth. That is a burden. That's a lot for anybody to carry. And I did not want them to carry that. Um, and to also set a precedent. Because as it goes on for years or months, people kind of accept, oh, too far mom will not turn to. Especially on Facebook. And people expect, accept, accept you for that. And it keeps going on and on and that becomes a less burden for yourself and it becomes an awareness of the people that are doing what they're doing because trust me there has been a lot of provocation i mean when you know the person wants you to answer the person wants you to respond the person wants you to defend and you if you if you're not lucky you find yourself using all of your energy trying to trying to curb that, trying to manage that. You can't. Again, we get back to the serenity prayer, you know, that we really do have the wisdom, you know, to, 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 to walk on the things we can control, but also to let go of the things we cannot control. You know, realizing that Munuma dem kerbuneka in Gambia, kong 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 salam alaikum, man la tufa jalo, man mani ka tufa jalo, bahar al ma explain al len. Gis nga ki ak man so gis e li mu def ni ak ni, ni ak, I can't. I really can't focus. I can't knock on any door. That's why I did not do that. And, and instead, I used my energy to listen to women's stories and how to help them, to set up a foundation, to work on myself. Because the honest truth is, I went into this deep ditch, once again, of depression, where you're asking yourself, is it worth it? Um, where you're trying to balance, does your silence mean acceptance of what people are saying? Does your silence mean you're running away? Or does it mean that you're focused on the prize? Um, trying to balance that, to say, hey, you know, I'm not speaking because I don't think I should speak on that. But when there's something to speak on, I go, and walk on the things that matter and move on. And it, sometimes in Gambia, and I think in general, it's seen as a weakness, especially when women choose quiet over defante because it's more understandable. Um, 
but but it's been this roller coaster it's not a straight linear line it's one day special i remember coming back to toronto and you know when that whole thing happened and for me it was like oh much bit of a happen you know i will come out i speak much is gonna happen and i'm gonna run away because guy would want to kill me or whatever and to, for all of that to happen but then pick up your bags come to toronto airport get off the airport and come to the house to an empty room and you put down your bags and you're just standing in this empty vacuum of a room and you know everything is just like replaying and it's all just revolving and it's like you've been picked from one universe of chaos to just another universe of stilt and and calm and um but you have to sit in that you have to stay away um oh let's not do that let's not do that okay um but also just watch the conversation um transition from as I said, all these different layers too. Okay, you know, probably it happened, but we were not in the room, you know. We were not in the room. So it sifts from, it's not true, she's completely lying, she's fabricating it, to she's a prostitute and she's a whore and she wanted money, to she's one of those dumb girls whatever and then they hear you speak or express yourself then it sifts to okay maybe it happened maybe they had a relationship but we don't know what happened in the room because that's a new and uncomfortable place to stay and a lot of women not just me find themselves within that gap whether it's in the united states whether it's canada whether it's germany ghana nigeria it sifts until it gets to that place where they can subtly justify what happened, um, coated in clothings of I care, or you know, I'm just trying to be safe. I'm just not trying to judge. The same people who, when someone who's been tortured, or but someone who was once involved in taking the life of someone, told them that I've been sexually abused or molested, they didn't ask for proof. They didn't say, we were not in the torture chambers. We were not there. It was outright sympathy, right? It's only with rape cases and throughout the TRC testimonies, me and many other women, where the society needed to be in the room for the bags over people's head, for the chokings and the killings and the cuttings of the head. They didn't have to be in the room to acknowledge the authenticity of the story, to acknowledge that one will not probably make that up, um, to believe somehow it is more believable that someone is capable of ordering, cutting people's heads off and their legs and their hands, but somehow they cannot rape somebody, you know? So for me, it was just interesting the whole time. I'm just sitting there and I'm like, oh, wow, wow. The entire time I'm just, you know, it was a mind twist for me the whole time. But then it's to just look around and realize that it's a common story um, for women. And so many other realizations, I mean, I think one of the most prominent ones that's happened to me is to realize that my story wasn't publicized or people were so interested in it because of me as a person, me, Tufa. My story got the time that it got and made it to the front page of the New York Times and CNN and BBC because of the power of the man that did it to me. And I have to recognize that privilege, right? That there's so many stories like me, so many Tufas, in neighborhoods and in our communities whose stories do not make it there. Why? Because of the person who did it to them. So it's very ironic and interesting just to show you how patriarchal the universe is, is that the acceptance and recognition of women's stories or abuses done to women's story, stories, body, sorry, literally sometimes depend on the power, the position, and the recognition of the man who did it.
you know let's give it the attention let's give it the focus let's give it all of that and and you wonder if what happened to me was done to me by my teacher if it was done to me by my community leader if it was done to me by my cousin would this be the reaction would it get the recognition it's got would it no it wouldn't so even as we fight and seek for justice our recognition depends on the people who do what they did to us and in recognizing that is why i took what i took that is the liberty to speak on mine whilst amplifying the other voices that they think is not worthy of talking about because the person who did it wasn't a president you hear me um is to use that opportunity to to say this exists this happens and if we can talk about it happening at the highest office of this country then we can trickle down to any other level right and talking about your vagina and what happened to your vagina is not an insult it doesn't take away your being it doesn't take away your value and who you are i get to determine that and it was interesting sometimes sitting back and hearing some men like oh uh kido i'm jacket oh um mandu matakakini and i'm there I'm like first of all <laughs> i wouldn't want a jacket like you i wouldn't want someone with that mindset man malan jekasur you know what i mean um but it's insane that when we talk about men's genitalia publicly, we, we are talking about it from a place of strength. Penises equals to strength, the for gore, you know, goria, strong. And when we talk about vaginas, it's uh, chaga attitude or chaga conversations or, um, uh, 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 or weakness or expose or gossip. Or, yeah, these are the two different dynamics. And it takes a lot to have to sit down and kind of accept that. We acknowledge we do have vaginas. They're part of our bodies. They're ours. We do what we want to do with it. When you violate it, when you abuse it, when you give yourself access to our bodies, we're going to say no. And when the no is not respected, when we find our strength, when we heal, we will come for you and we will say, you did something to us that we did not approve of. And if acknowledging violence being done to your body sows a sense of Yahoo or Chage or whatever, just sit down for a moment and think about that. And for somehow that I am supposed to carry the shame, the young girls, the baby who was sleeping in her bed, apparently she, she was dressed on modestly because Pampa Sambi Mungi Deme side. For all of us, this woman and their experiences to kind of carry the shame, especially me, for me to carry the shame for you in your power and your position and all the might of a country, to not have the strength to accept a no, but to violate me. And somehow I am supposed to be Rus, like Manmawara Rus Lolo. Somehow. That is what is ingrained in our heads. That's what they teach us. That's what the culture pushes in. And you have to unlearn that. You have to literally push and pull. Until you take it out. And parts of me coming out is to have that happen, is to change that mindset when it comes to rape, sexual violence, women's and women's bodies, what happens to them, microaggressions, all these little things that we do that lead up to actually penetrating into somebody without their consent, conscience. Um, so it's been a lot of thinking and I like to do more of the thinking and less of the talking um also there was also a lot of disappointments of course because there are people that you would think they were like in your corner somehow and which is very conf confusing about the gambian community so it's very hard sometimes to know where somebody belongs 
or like la lingon you know like like where are you um so for me it was very confusing to kind of like be in that and i couldn't i couldn't keep up um and some people that you kind of looked up to especially when you are you know younger and now you're seeing them say this and they don't know and i think sometimes when people sit behind laptops or computers or you know when you're typing i think they forget that the other person they're typing to or talking about is a human being like with blood and flesh you know i'm na yai i'm na papa i'm na raka and all of that i think they feel like they're speaking to robots and like what you say doesn't matter like it doesn't get to people there's no sense of accountability for what you say you know um and that it is okay to get into somebody's inbox and you know i was about to i was going to go into my messenger and kind of go over go through you know some of their crazy insults i've gotten and some of them it was way later that i would just go and i would just find them and some of them it will go to like your unread message or like people you haven't accepted that corner excuse me and you know i went there and you know there's a lot of a lot of we are coming for you, you prostitute whore, you know, there's a lot of that. But I, I say to myself, why? Why should I sit here and go through those comments when I was literally looking for them, passing all the positive ones that I haven't even responded to? But also it's very human that we click to the negative than we do with the positive. It's way easier to see the one person. So you're going to scroll down. Oh, you're great. You're brave. Oh my God, I love you. Thank you for doing this thing. You see all of that. But there's just that one line with some random name, Kujali Kujali something, who is saying, um, I kill you, bitch something, and the spellings are all mixed up. You have to literally put the spellings together for you to understand the insult. And somehow that's the one that stick, you know? It's, it's human. Um, so I, I, I said it wasn't important, but also to just go back to what I was saying when I spoke about visibility for women who, whose perpetrators are not famous enough probably to um, um, uh, make it to the front lines. You go, I, I decided to, so I was putting together, which we are going to go through some of the cases and we're going to recognize the ones that have not, that are not here with us, um, that are not as lucky as I am, you are, and so many other survivors, the ones who lost their lives to violence that is being done to their bodies, to women that have lost their jobs, to women who, has lost, who have lost their social capital, not because they couldn't survive what happened to them, but because they spoke of what happened to them. We're going to recognize that um, for a moment. And I'll just pull one thing up, which is really interesting. Um, give me a second here. And... Cheers to the ones that we got. Cheers to the ones that we did, but you're not. I know that you true. Just to the ones All the memories And the memories bring back Memories bring back you do, 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 do. Everybody hurts sometimes, everybody hurts someday, yeah, yeah. Here's to the ones that we lost. And I'm hurting we've been through. Toast to the ones that we lost on the way. Back all the memories, and the memories bring back you. 
So when you go to when you go to Google and let's say you want to get actual information and small boy with Tilimbi and you type in rape cases in Gambia, you know, you keep scrolling, I don't know if you can see it. The whole page, the whole page. There's an invisibility of women whose abuses are not powerful. Um, rape cases in Gambia, which is ironic because one of the reasons why I decided or thought about coming out with my story was to say, was me doing my research and going to type about women, women that have spoken out publicly in Gambia and what that looks like and what do you do, what, does the, what is the blueprint, and not and not finding any, right? And after speaking out myself, going to the, when you type in rape cases in Gambia, is literally Al Jazeera, I am Tufa, breaking the silence on the sexual assault. The humanitarian, the Gambia's Me Too, year break silence on rape. NPR, Me Too, testimony in Gambia pits beauty queen against former president. CNN, Gambia's former president Yajamba accused of rape. I Gambia, rape and assault cases on the rice. Too fast match. Um, New York Times, beauty queen charged of rape. You go down videos, is a YouTube link, ex dictator accused of rape, ex Gambian president accused of rape. It was necessary, you know, all the way down to the last, to the last search. And no matter how you search that again and how you click it back and, 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 and type and type again and again just to get information that's what you get and in recognition of that it's why we do have to acknowledge the other stories that do not make it to the front lines that do not matter because they're rapists somehow it's not you know it's not big enough it's not worthy of a storyline if you understand what i mean um so that's just like the tip of the ice back of some of my observations and the weird journey and roller coaster of one day okay, one day not okay. And it's crazy because you also come out to take that burden off of your shoulders and it is off of my shoulders. Um, but it's crazy how I retreat back to my shell again. Um, because it's safe there. And even when I was in Gambia, to show you how steeped in some of the words that we say and the things that we do that justify rape is, you know, I, I went to pick up a document from somebody that is the same week after all of that, I had to run because I had to set up the foundations. I was running between Banjul and Kanifing and someone who's you know with goodwill and good intention is supposedly on my side and 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 is appreciative of me but when the, when he came to the window because it's the first time he's meeting me he took the document from me and he said oh oh i think i recognize you you're too firm I'm like oh yeah, yeah yeah and you know he's like oh you know we're so proud of you and all of that and all of that i said great um, but then there was a part of the document that needed to be signed, so I stepped out of the car to do that. And the person looked at me from head to toe and said, Oh, just now a little more time with the fuck, okay? Moments like that. Moments like that where I go numb because... This person thinks they're saying something nice and I'm supposed to probably feel good about that when what you're literally saying is that I look rapeable or raping me is kind of justified because I have the body to be... Instances like this where I go completely numb. I literally go completely numb to how do you respond? You know, because you know this is not an enemy, this is not somebody that wants to fight you, this is not somebody that wants to, you know. Oh, okay, so here we have somebody. 
Okay, so I think so book is spelled dool. Dool is D-U-L-L. -L. So could if D-O-L-L -L is doll, doll, right? Then do they make sense? So you want to put dool as in D-U-L-L. -L. So, you know, I would just block you and give you some time to go and learn how to spell dool. And bye-bye. Thanks. Um, but, you know, it's instances like that. And people, when they meet you, thinking that it's okay to kind of hug you and touch your body because somehow, I don't know, you've talked about your body, so your body is accessible. L kind of doing the same thing that you're saying, let's not do, you know? Um, so for me, it's interesting to watch all of those perspectives, um, but it's also been very healing for me to hear other women, to understand that you are not alone, to understand that, these are stories of thousands and thousands of women. If it's not the most powerful lawyer, it is the president, it is the imam, it is the, the teacher, it is the brother, it is the cousin. It is so many, so many, 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 many people. Um, so we acknowledge that and, 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 and we move forward. So in moving forward, that is where the Tufa Foundation comes in. So currently, just to really sum it up, um, after setting it up, of course, putting it together with a great um, 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 team, of course, and uh, uh, a number of people that are like really, really supportive and very specific people that are super supportive. Um, we are working on a project that is kind of a sketchbook, um, sketched by hands and then digitized, but printed as a booklet for students in schools but we're trying to target all peer health groups and also prioritizing rural gambia and it's really a sketchbook that depicts all forms of sexual and gender-based violence in all the variations that it comes and we did this drawing inspiration from the testimony of auntie uh, uh, uh mrs hadimboj baro who testified at the trc and has a lot of experience in gender-based um violence issues especially within the gambian context so it's to put that into very colorful playful but truthful sketchbooks for young people to to read and to enjoy, but also make it very um, 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 presentable for them. And we want to make thousands of copies of this. Um, we have already digitized all the materials and we are in the printing phase of doing that. And we are doing that with Sites of Conscience. Um, we are also working on a project with the Swiss Embassy where um, we are making uh, mini series that are, uh, let's say reverse realities of a man uh, in a woman's life, but within the Gambian's context, another mini series on uh, a rape being reported, but this time by a guy, and the person who did it is a prominent female. And we take all the words that we throw onto women and victims and use it on a man and see how it sounds. Do we sound ridiculous when we say to the man, Are you a virgin? What were you doing at her office? You know, stuff like that. Um, but also, advocacy video involving people that we think people listen to in Gambia you know you have the Imam Babalese you have um, G you have uh, a representative from the Women's Bureau we have a representative from the TRC some young activists you have Lala the Absa Sambas you know all these people coming together to make that video that will also run on QTV for um, weeks also, one of the major ones is a documentary, which will require myself to be in the Gambia to do. So these are some of the things that um, um, we are doing. Also dedicating some of my time, mostly Saturdays and Sundays, having phone calls with girls and women in Gambia who want to talk, who wants to talk, who wants to express what it is like to be in this realm. Um, and what does healing in silence and secret mean? And what does healing visibly in front of everybody what does that also look like um also a video to kind of look at how sgbv issues are treated especially in truth commissions gambia to be specific but also more broadly um generally when it comes to testimonies that have to do with how is that um 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 represented what are some of the loopholes um uh, some of the frustrations and concerns as well so a video on that as well so you can look forward to that um but also amazingly is myself so for the past one 
year on a personal level I've been writing a book and I am glad and happy to say just one year anniversary of since I decided to be visible with my story that we have got Penguin Random House uh, uh, Canada which is one of the biggest publishing houses in Canada to take up the book to have interest in it and we look forward to worldwide publishing and worldwide, worldwide sales as well so the manuscript is out for submission and that has been a new process for me but i really enjoyed the entire thing and hopefully the book gives you a perspective on um on all the matriarch that shaped who i am you know the african perspective on feminism that we tend to leave behind the insulting viewpoint that when women do stand up for themselves especially africans it is considered a westernized woman a westernized idea as if it is not possible for black afro women to stand up and fight for themselves and seek for their rights and say we want equality we want better um to kind of attach that to whiteness and to whitewash that is a same, right? And what is what, what the book is trying to do is draw attention to that, to kind of look back to generations of women before me from my family, you know, uh, uh, some forms of resistance that they did. At the time, you wouldn't see it as feminism, probably it's not as fancy as you would in other parts of the world, but that is resistance. You know, our women resist in so many different ways and forms. So I think when we narrow down what feminism is, we leave out a lot of women. Um, so we have to broaden what it is, what it means to be a feminist, what a feminist can look like and represent as well. So that perspective, great. Um, not much of what happened to me because that is already out there, uh, but you know, more in-depth stories of planning the escape um, every step of the way, more in-depth stories of my settlement in Canada, more in-depth um, in, um, in explaining of what, how I see where I come from and what it means, and also what it looks like moving forward. So I hope that you look forward to that. That is pretty exciting. Um, so we, we have to acknowledge, and I would just take you through it for a second um and these are just few of the stories um few of the girls and women um so many of them that you can't even mention because you cannot name their names um which is really unfortunate but here we go um you are vera omozua of nigeria raped and killed in a church. In 2019, a girl in Senegal raped by a family friend. She said, it's really hard to suffer from sexual assault that ends up in pregnancy. And she said this after she tried to abort her child and kill herself. Bineta Kamara of Tambakunda, killed in an attempted rape. In Sierra Leone recently, Five-year-old Khadija, raped and murdered. In South Africa, school pupil Janika Malo, 14 years old, is raped and died after her head is apparently hit in a concrete block. No arrests have been made in her case either. In Gambia, the very few. A one-year-old and a nine-year-old child, children, raped by their family members. A nine-year-old child raped by a family member in Talende. A five-year-old raped in Lower River region a few weeks ago, and the matter is now proceeding in court. 15-year-old student raped by vice principal of a school, and still no legal action has been taken. A student raped on her way from school in Bakote, Gambia in 2019. An 18-year-old girl raped by her ustas. Nothing has come off of it. She's pregnant with twins. 
A girl, 15 years old, has, has been raped by her father several times leading up to her pregnancy. And this is two months ago. 14 year old girl impregnated by her father in Lower River region. Nothing has come up of it. You know, these stories and these people are the reason why we have to speak up. These are the people and the stories why we have to continue the conversation. You know, these stories and these women and girls keep me going. And to kind of just sum up this, because I feel like I've been here for a while, um, I need to go, is to say, all the insults, all the guilt I have to carry for even my mother to look at that woman who nobody knew or knows. She's she's as quiet. She's not like she's not like me. And to put her in that situation. And to have to feel guilty for putting her in a position where she's prone to assault and insult and all of that. You know. to the pain and the depression and the nightmares that I have to go through to, to the hassle, to, to just feeling like the world is choking at your neck, to you know feeling naked when I stand because of what I put out, to all those feelings, to all of those fears, to all of those long days and nights and continued struggle. If you ask me, would I do it again? If I was given the opportunity knowing what I know and experiencing all that I experienced, would I do it again? Will I come out again? Yes. Yes. I would do it over and over and over again i would because it is all worth it it is worth the conversation that we are having it is worth the sense of having myself back to me it is worth feeling relieved of a burden and a story it is worth the spaces of being the woman I've spoken to. It is worth the thousand stories I've heard there. It is worth the consciousness I have come into. The woman I have become. The woman I continue to become. The strength that I, that I just pull out of. I don't even know, I don't know where. It is all worth it. I will do this experience again and again and again. I will take the insults a thousand more times again. I will take the misrepresentation a billion times more again. I would work in that lane each time I am given that opportunity because it's all worth it for myself, for those women, for those girls, for the conversations that we dare to have now, for all the cases that are so in much in the consciousness of people on Facebook and WhatsApp and we will just talk about it. It's okay to talk about it. It's kind of cool to talk about it now. It's worth it. It is worth it. So I would do it if that's the question. No regrets. Um, the fight hasn't even started. <laughs> um, also on another personal note, Jimbi Jame, I hope you are very comfortable in Sweden. Um, and I hope you receive whatever letters come to you. And I hope you answer wherever I call you. Um, on that note, I would really just let go of you guys and blah, blah, being before I start end up um, 
speaking into my comedy and start making jokes about that but we are proud we are bold we are female we are feminine um um we are loud we are clear um gambian women are really trying to make themselves heard assertive taking their rightful places in this society saying hello hold on and doing it so unapologetically i cannot even get into the names and of course most importantly so also thank everybody who has whether i have responded or not whether we have spoken directly or not but you've shown support to the women who have taken this story and recognize that it is their story this is not a two for story you know it's one thing for two for two talk about this and now we're all talking about this but this is not a two for issue for the women who do not let ego or anything get in their way but to recognize that this is a fight for all of us and we are all in this together for your sisters and your aunties and every woman that you know in your life i cannot tell you the amount of people that have reached out i'm sorry to the ones that i cannot reach out to but i am appreciative of the ones who have taken up the fight the ones who have been fighting way before tufa was even a conversation i mean this has been a thing that so many women has been fighting for so many women have been trying to push in the forefront and i am so happy and i'm so glad one year after all of that was in the out i am still here i am still present i am still visible i still walk with you i still hear you and we can do this to the anti of the world the marion volkman to the mothers of the world to the absasambas the lala tourists the amira fofanas you know uh, uh, uh the fatu muloski the isotu bokums the survivors the victims the ones who refuse to let the blabbing of a powerful man and society sway their path to the mina manes to the mama linger sars i i can't i i I should stop talking because I am going to miss out some people, but also to our beautiful men, to these strong men, to these very supportive men who say that they are willing to let go of their privilege. They are willing to share equality with us. They are willing to listen to us. You know, the Babu Abdullah Jobs, the, the Madi Jabates of our world, you know, the Uncle Bankamanes of our world, you know, the Laminjais of our world, all these brilliant men who are saying, you know, it's one thing to believe in your story or whatever, but we hear you. We'll listen to you and we respect that you want to take this position. To Benny, all those great, beautiful, strong men who are willing to share the stage with us, I say thank you. We love you. We appreciate you. You're changing what we say should be. And when we are all equal, when we are all heard, when all of our bodies are respected, we would all do better we will all be better for it we are not doing this for us we are doing it for the generations to come i do not want a leader a president or whoever to rape my daughter to rape my cousin to rape my neighbor just because they do have the power yeah Jame, when he did what he did if he knew if only he knew how unswayed i am how i am willing to go on and on for 20 years, if it takes that long, he wouldn't have done it. If he knew how clear the woman he was doing that to was, if he knew how sitting I was, if he knew how less distracted I am, he wouldn't. He never knew this would be a conversation today and in the open. And if you support him, great, all power to you. You did not rape me. Yaya Jame raped me. Yaya Jame violated my body. And when I speak, I speak to Yaya Jame. When I speak my justice, I speak it, I seek it for Yaya Jame and Jimmy Jame. These are the two people. If you want to own the story, if you want to own the being the perpetrator, great. Have fun doing that. Um, but to the greater Jame to justice team, we are so dope. They will see us. I love you all. Bye. How do I end this? How do they? Okay. Uh, Kimo on an egg. Fatuma da Rahman Koka. Because she is the pro at this. She should have been here. Uh.
Okay, here we go. Bye. And the memories bring back you. Do do. That we got. Toast to the ones that we lost. Back on the memories, and the memories bring back, bring back you. Do 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 do